Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That's from that's that's how you know a professional. He came in right at eight o'clock. Shout out to Rob Hardy. What's happening? What's up, man? How you feeling, bro? <laughs> man, I'm blessed, brother. Blessed and highly favored. <laughs> Hey, Rob, this is my homeboy, Lee. This is my assistant. What's going on, my man? Lee, what's happening, man? How you feeling, man? All right, all right. Yeah, he just helping out. When we talk about certain things, he pop up pictures on the screen and stuff like that. Oh, all right, any old dick pics you got here? <laughs> I'm, joking. I'm, joking. I'm joking. Hey, hopefully y'all don't have access to that kind of stuff. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we got access to your, to your cloud right before we started, so... <laughs> No, nah, man, um, brother, first of all, thank you for doing this and hopping on with me, man. Um, I, I created this platform, Urban Legends, because I wanted to have a platform for people that I consider living legends out here and people that I consider are making legendary moves in the business. Um, and you're somebody that I, of course, I mean, you put me in my first movie, <laughs> you know, but, <laughs> but not only that, man, you somebody that continue to make strides out here in Hollywood and in the business. Uh, and I wanted to have a platform to celebrate somebody of your caliber who has so much knowledge and information and perspective to give people. So that's why I wanted to have you on here. Hey man, look, I appreciate you having me, man. Uh, and shout out, you know, to, you know what I'm saying, to you for all the big moves that you're making. I see you, you know what I'm saying, on the screen. I see you on the stage. You making it happen, you know what I'm saying? From Florida to Atlanta to Hollywood. Straight up. Me, so that's what's up. Straight up. Hey, yeah. you know what, something I wanted to bring up? You, you always call me King Just, right? Yeah. That's something yeah. you say. And I'm just starting to use that more like I say nigga, but I'm trying to use the word king instead of the N word, right? I'm yeah. trying to I'm trying to do my part to, you know, <laughs> where did that come from? Do you just I, I'm sure you call other people king also, but I just want to know what gave you that mindset to call people king? So you know, uh uh I still be on my niggaism too, Big Just. I'm gonna go ahead and tell you that. You know, what <laughs> Straight I'm saying? Up. Me, me too. Yeah. You gonna hear it a okay. hundred times okay. by the end of this interview. Yeah. So, um, no, you know what it is though is is that like you know uh, I don't say that to everybody, but it's just certain people that just have a, a an air and a presence about them. You know what I'm saying? Especially like as you like giving cats nicknames, it just seemed like it was something that fits you because just from the from the moment that, you know, and Will was the first person to mention you, but when you was at, at Clark, he was like, man, my homeboy from the crib, da, da, da. but it was something about you that just that just uh, felt like, yo, this dude, this dude has something and he gonna make it, cause that's in his spirit, you know what I'm saying? I just I just recognized that in you. So that's, that's kind of where it came from, just embracing that. Man, that's love, bro. That's yeah. love. So you grew up in Philly, right? Yeah. When did the directing dream come about? Being a kid in Philadelphia, when did you start thinking like, yo, I want to get into directing? Yo, man, I took a, a, a video elective class like in, in junior high, you know what I'm saying? And uh, it's the first time I saw a camera, we had this little, this little project with a camcorder. So, you know, we did a little project, we showed it and people thought it was cool when they laughed, you know? And, um, then, you know, that led to, in high school, me knowing somebody with a camera, and we was just bored. So we were like, um, well, we're going to shoot a little music video. So, you know, I knew people that wanted to dance. I knew people that knew how to rhyme, you know, myself included. So I was like, okay, I'm going to shoot it. You're going to press pause on the tape. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You were spitting? Wait a minute. You a rapper? Wait a minute. Hell, yeah, man. Hell, yeah. Bro. Okay. Listen, man. Okay. Listen, man, oh, hold on, man, hold on, hold on. No, hey, I, want, I want to hear something. Oh, I mean, I, I, I'm just saying, you was checking like kind of strong there for a second. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, and you know, I, ain't, I, ain't, I haven't written anything in a long time, but what's funny is, is that, you know, in my past life, you know what I'm saying, I went through a bunch of MC names from Robbie D to GQ to Rollo, you know what I'm saying? So all that stuff was like my MC progression that took me through, uh, took me through fam. As a matter of fact, me and Will had cut a, a, a song together when he was on the radio up there. So, you know, it lasted for a long time. 
That's amazing, bro. I never knew that, man. That and and I, I don't know if you know. I started doing music. I done put out like two mixtapes and everything like that. So that's why I was like, damn, that's crazy. Um. Uh, so, anyways, Philadelphia, you got the camcorder. You cutting together the music video. Yeah. So and and look, you know, cutting together the music video back then, man. You would press pause and then you would start shooting something else and you press record again. And that's kind of how we did it. And then people would come through and be like, yo, that was cool. And that led to um, us doing like a little, little mini movie my senior year of high school, just for fun. And when it was done, we showed it in the auditorium at the school and my homeboy was like, yo, you should do this. And that was the wow. first time I ever thought about it. And you know, Spike Lee was popping back then. And, and you know, the Hudlin brothers had house party. So all that stuff was going on, Robert Townsend, Hollywood Shuffle. So that made me think, man, you know, directing sounds hot. So that's kind of like what started the bug. Wow, that's amazing. Now, did you do a, is this correct? You did a movie in high school called G-Man? Was, is that, what? what's G-Man exactly? Yeah, so what happened was is that um, when I was in high school, I got a scholarship to go to a boarding school, like right outside the city. So it was called George School. So G-Man was about, uh, a, a, a black superhero in this in this situation. It was kind of like that movie Blank Man that like Damon Wayans did back in the day. Classic. So it was a comedy, you know what I'm saying? So so we shot that bad boy. The school gave us an $800 budget, man. We was balling. $800. <laughs> <laughs> Straight up. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so we shot the movie. And uh, yeah, man, that was like the first time. And you know, my, my friends that, you know, could draw, did the posters. You know, again, you know, if you could act, so what, whatever your thing was, we was like, yo, get in the movie, we're going to do it because it's something to do. And uh, yeah, that, that, that kicked it up. Wow. Now, I'm going to run down some of your credits um, because I want to get into the whole fam meeting Will and, and the, the start of Rainforest. Now, any of y'all don't know, anybody watching, um, which I'm sure a lot of y'all do know, but he did the gospel Stomp the Yard, Think Like a Man was a producer, Three Could Play That Game with Vivica A. Fox, No Good D with Idris El Elba, Taraji P. Henson, and been directing a, a ton of Power episodes. Um, so what made you move to uh, Florida in a 10 fam you? Hey man, you know, uh, my mom's, got a job in florida and she was like it was right before i went to college she was like yo i need you to apply to some florida school so you can get this in-state bruh in case some other things don't work out for you so i was i wound up getting uh a scholarship to fam and um and that's why i wound up going it was crazy because i didn't want to go to school in florida i wanted to go to school you know up north be around my friends and i thought i was going to this other school but didn't get enough money so I go to FAM for the summer engineering program and my next door neighbor was a dude that was supposed to be going to school in Philly, but he didn't get as much money as he wanted and he wound up at FAM and that was Will. So that was like my first homeboy and we were neighbors and uh, you know, you kind of jumped from there. That's crazy. And so yeah. who, who idea was it to do y'all first film like uh, Chocolate City? So uh, that was my idea. So uh, I wanted to be the filmmaker. Will wanted to be an entrepreneur. So what happened was is that... Um, oh, anybody don't know, he's talking about Will Packer. That's yeah, 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 yeah. Right. So, <laughs> so Will Packer and me were, were, uh, were friends, and then we were uh, line brothers. We both pledged Alpha down at FAM together. And um, it was crazy because... You know, uh, we were both on different summer internships in, in engineering. So I was at NASA in, in Alabama. He was in Motorola in South Florida. And I'm sitting over here seeing all these movies come out like Menace of Society and Boomerang and stuff like that. And I was like, yo, man, you know, I hate what I'm doing. I hate this engineering thing. And because I had done the G-Man movie in high school, a lot of my friends saw it and they were like, yo, you did something already. So you a filmmaker, right? Why don't you make another movie? Mm. So then that, that became like the focus of like, yeah, you know what? What if I do make a movie? And so then I got some people together. Will was one of them. 
he was an actor in the movie. Then he <laughs> became one of the producers of it. And then once it started popping, then he was like, Rob, this is a business, mm. you know? And then that kind of like got us together. And we started like thinking that maybe we could, we could really hustle that into a career or something. Now with Chocolate City, cause y'all made some money from Chocolate City, correct? Yeah, yeah. How did y'all go about the distribution and, and getting it out there to, to get and make money from an independently financed movie? So, so we shot Shaka City while we were students at FAMU, the Florida Anime University, as I like to call it. Hey, straight and, up. Uh, hey, man. So, um, so we shot it, but what we wanted to do is we wanted to make it something to where if you went to our school, you felt like it was our thing. So we had a premiere uh, in Lee Hall, like the main ballroom at our school. And then we cut a deal with like the independent theater um, where they basically, we rented out the theater and you know, we could charge what we wanted. And they had a video projector because we couldn't afford to cut the film. So we just had it finished on, on videotape. So they would, show, they would show our film, you know, with a video projection. So like the image was smaller than the actual film or whatever, but people paid. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we had have, we have folks that worked at the radio station. They had a little music video show. Folks that worked over there. So they, they did all the marketing and it was always sold out. So when it was all said and done, we had like, you know, 10 bands in like a brown paper bag, legal money. Damn. So as like some broke high school, I mean, as some broke college kids, we were like, yo, they paid us to do what we love. Oh, it's a wrap. We doing this. What was, how you much know, money did y'all spend to make Chocolate City? Uh, well, it was, it would have cost 20,000, you know what I'm saying? And I say would have because a lot of, some of the stuff we got donated because since we were like a state school, we like, you know, wrote letters and stuff like that to the different equipment houses. And then uh, they could like lend us the equipment since we had an advisor who, who was responsible for it. So they can write it off on their taxes. So a lot of the money that we should have had raised, we got it, you know, different, you know, we, we got that. We didn't have to spend the cash because we got a lot of stuff donated. So probably in cash, we probably raised like 9,000. Wow, that's amazing. And you know, I'm asking these questions because I'm sure there's a lot of film. And one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on is I know the independent struggle and hustle. Now I wouldn't say struggle, the independent hustle that you were on to get to where you're at. Uh, and so, especially nowadays with, with anybody could get a camera, you can shoot something on your cell phone. It's like, there's no excuse why you can't go out and accomplish something. Um, so I, I, I just want people to even hear like what you was doing even back then. And then it's like, okay, now after you done shot it, here's a way that you might could get it into a theater, you know? and get it get it distributed then with all these streaming services nowadays i mean you know it's just way more outlets nowadays how did the this is what i always want to know about the twa movies how did that come about was that did that come from source material or was that an original idea <laughs> hey man you know what did, did the menage twa movie come from source material <laughs> hey it was a lot going on back then, you know what I'm saying? So I'm not going to say that it came from source material, but it was a lot going on back then. Uh, <laughs> but I will say at that time- uh, It was inspired by some true events. <laughs> hey man. Hey, but, but you know, back then, like movies like Basic Instinct and Fatal Attraction, those were like the popular movies. So, you know, shout out to the homie Will Packer because he was like, yo, Rob, we should do a movie kind of in that world, right? Mm. So. Cut to we getting haircuts, Green Bar, Green Bra Mall barbershop. Shout out to so Green Bra Mall. There. Exactly. Shout out to Green Bra Mall. Shout out to Red Money and Prince Woods. You know. Wait, hold on. I want to back up there. I want to back up. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Because I yeah. I want to do this podcast to really know the journey. What made okay. y'all go from Fam to Atlanta? What was that decision? So here's what happened. So um, our last year, uh, so so once once we did Chocolate City and we shot the movie and it made some money locally. We started entering film festivals. So a lot of that stuff was through the Black Filmmaker Foundation. So Warrington Hudlin uh, and, you know, Byron Lewis at the time and, um, you know, Reginald Hudlin also had this film festival thing going. Jeff Friday also was in the mix at that time. 
you know, and it really, you know, grew. Um, now, this, this was like, this is what led up to Acapulco Black Film Festival. Mm, so back okay. then it was the Black Filmmaker Foundation and they would have these screenings. So we went to one in New York and then we went to one in LA. We did some stuff in Chicago. So all those things helped us get a home video deal. So at the time, Blockbuster was the big video thing. So when we got our movie into Blockbuster, it felt like it was real to us. And even though we didn't get paid a whole lot of money, it didn't matter, it made us legit. So, so what we decided was, we told our parents, yo, we're gonna raise a little bit of money and give us five years. As long as we graduate, give us five years after that to do whatever we wanna do to make this film thing happen. And if it doesn't work, we'll go be engineers. Right. So we chose Atlanta because it was close to Tallahassee. Um, it was way cheaper than Hollywood or New York. And they had like a, a, an, ind an independent scene, independent movie scene that was kind of popping. So we felt like, man, we can go to Atlanta and hustle something up. And we already some broke dudes anyway. So we might as well move here and be broke. Y'all ain't got broke no other. more. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? And we got a <laughs> movie in Blockbuster. So we'll make it happen. So that's what we did. We rented out a crib in Jonesboro, Georgia. And, um, you know, started, started that move. Dope. Okay, so then now back to the, the, the Twa movie. I'm trying to think what exactly where we was at with the Twa. Because <laughs> I wanted to know, when you, when, you did the, when you did the Twa movies, this is something I wanted to know when you did the Twa movies. Were you hesitant of what your parents might think of the at that material like was that a thought like i don't know how they gonna feel about this yeah yeah when uh will pissed me on the idea like i said it was his idea you know again brilliant idea but when he first pissed me i was like a Minaji twa movie bro i don't know man so it took some you know convincing me and him went back and forth and we did it and the whole idea was yo we gonna write a movie that we could shoot at the crib in Jonesboro, Georgia, where we were staying for thirty thousand dollars. And so, um, and then it was gonna be he was gonna raise ten, I was gonna raise ten, and we had another partner at the time named Greg Anderson, and Greg was gonna come in and raise ten. And so, and we were gonna go to friends and family, you know, investors, and that kind of grew in a little bit more money because once you got a little bit of money, people will give you some more. And that grew and grew into what became Twa. And we spent all our money and nobody would pick it up. And um, so we went to Acapulco Black Film Festival because a movie the year before called Have Plenty had got picked up, got a deal with Miramax and, and, uh, and made like $2 million at the box office. Wow. And we were like, we gonna do that. So we went there, nobody picked our movie up. But we met some investors that were like, hey, if y'all can come up with a plan to, to self-distribute this, then we might be interested in that. And that's that's how that's what jumped it off for us. Well, and what was the plan? The, the plan for us was we were gonna release uh Twa on 50 screens in the southeast. And so that's what we did. So we, 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 we like divided up like the major markets in the Southeast. We went as far West as like Chicago and Houston and Dallas, but everything else was mostly in this, it was mostly from DC on down. And we all said, we're going to go one weekend. We're going to release the movie in one or two theaters and we're going to spend our money marketing to those places. And we did. And we had the, second highest per screen average in the country based wow. on the number of screens that we had. And that's, you know, when Sony called our house and asked us who the hell Rainforest was. <laughs> right. <laughs> Straight up. And that's, yeah. You make enough money, yeah. somebody go come call it. Hey man, let me tell you something. You know what I'm saying? We, we, we had, that, we had that, that line where if it rings twice, that's the business line. So it rang twice <laughs> and it was them. That's wild. How how you how did you all come up with the name Rainforest? Uh, well, Rainforest it was it was basically because you know back in the day they had a big um, they had a big mission to save the rainforest because rainforest you know in South America provided provides the Earth with like seventy five percent of its oxygen and 
because people were burning it down to develop. And be, within there, there's like all these medicines that's in the trees and all that stuff. So basically, we saw the rainforest as a resource for the, for the world that right. needed to be saved. And we felt that Black people were like the rainforest. We were inventors. We were creators. We contribute so much to society. But because of, you know, oppression and racism and so on and so forth, you know, and like economic peril, that we as black people needed to be, you know, appreciated like the rainforest and saved and preserved like the rainforest. So that mm. was like a correlation between the two. Oh, that's deep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, fam, I, you stuck, baby. You know. Hey, shout out to fam. You know, so I'm a Clark Atlanta University alumni myself, but you know, I respect all HBCUs. <laughs> I see what you're doing. Of course. Now the gospel. This, this is when I enter your life. <laughs> the gospel. <laughs> this is a question I always had. And I'm going to tell everybody the gospel. First of all, let me tell you how you just have to follow your mind and how I even got my acting career started off professionally. Will, I met Will when I was uh, a senior in high school. He came to speak to all the students at the school, at, like at some event, right, in St. Petersburg, Florida. And he was talking about y'all had did so. I think he said he had did something for Puffy. I, I, I believe he y'all did y'all do something for Puffy, or y'all met Puffy back in the day or something. We, we met him, and and we were trying to get on with Puff, but you know, you know that didn't work out. Okay, he didn't want to. Yeah. He didn't want to go shopping with y'all. All right. Nah. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I was just talking. To, I was talking to Jackie Long earlier today, but <laughs> I was asking him about Puffy and him shopping for people. But anyways, <laughs> so he came to talk. He was talking something about making movies and Puffy and all that. And I was like, "Yo, I want to be an actor." Uh, and I said, "Yo," so I went to holler at, at, at Will. He gave me a card. He like, "Yo, if you ever come up to Atlanta, holler at me." Just so happened I got into Clark Atlanta U University. So when I got up to Atlanta, I said, yo, I'm trying to, I'm trying to be an actor or whatever. That's when y'all was doing the gospel. He said, yo, come to the set as a background actor. And I was like, cool. I asked all my friends. I'm like, yo, y'all want to go to this movie set? Be, be extras on this movie? They was like, man, we at school, man. Get your old bitch ass out of my face. I said, oh, no disrespect. So I said, all right, well, fuck y'all then. So I said, I'm going to go to this goddamn movie set by my damn self. So I pull up, you know, say what's up to Will, kind of reintroduce myself. Yo, no longer than five minutes being on that set is when he introduced me to you. He was like, yo, this the director, this Rob Hardy. And I remember, I don't know if you remember, I definitely remember, you was like, yo, what you do? And I was like, man, I do anything. Sing, dance, act, whatever, fly, whatever you need me to do, I, I do it. And I remember y'all, this is my memory, y'all kind of whispered to each other. <laughs> and then you was like, one of y'all was like, hey, you want to audition for a part of the movie? I was like, hell yeah. Y'all gave me the sides. I went into y'all trailer. Y'all, I think y'all shared a trailer at that <laughs> point. That's how long ago this was. Y'all ain't sharing trailers now. <laughs> y'all should share. I went in y'all trailer, learned them lines, did my audition on tape. I'm talking about on the spot. I probably had them sides for 20 minutes. Y'all went back, talked, came back, you hired. The next day I was filming my first, my first movie. Um, shout out to you. I will be forever thankful and grateful to you and Will for, for doing that for me. Um, I remember that, man. I remember that. And, and, and look, and look, my favorite line, you know, one of my favorite lines of that movie was when Boris Kojo was like, hey, man, you know what I'm saying? Come holler at me at church. And you were like, church? church. You know what I'm saying? That was it, man. That was the line right there. That got you know a good laugh. Now, and, and I want people to know the reason they 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 asked me to audition because there was uh, a, another actor or rapper or whatever who wasn't showing up. Um, and that's why they say ain't nothing is luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Now yeah. I went to a performing arts high school. Um, uh, so the preparation was there and then the opportunity came and then everything aligned. When, when you did the gospel, I wanted to know, was that something? Cause you wrote it, right? You wrote the yeah. gospel. Yeah. Was that something that came from a personal experience 
or were you all seeing that Tyler Perry was having success in the kind of gospel realm and you all was thinking, let's do a, a movie in that, that area because Tyler Perry's having success with those type of films? Nah, it was, um, we had a manager uh, at that time named Holly Davis Carter. And Holly represented, she managed Usher back then along with his mom. Uh, she did all, all the movie stuff for him. And then she also had all these gospel artists from Mary Mary, Fred Hammond, Fred Ham Hammond, all these, all these artists. So she was like, yo, you guys thought to write a gospel movie. So kind of like with Twa, I was like, mm, I don't know. But then I was thinking, you know what? We've been the Twa boys for a second. So we probably do to do something totally different mm. from being the Twa Boys. So the gospel gave us a chance to kind of flex a different muscle. You know what I'm saying? It had a built-in demo because of, you know, it was, you know, a faith-based movie. But, you know, I tried to make it about somebody that was cynical. And so um, so that's that's kind of how that movie came together. And that changed it for us as filmmakers because that was the first time, and we had, you know, started doing movies for Sony, but they were always like erotic thrillers. That's all they would let us do once Twa popped. They didn't want to hear anything else except erotic thrillers. So the gospel was the first time that they gave us a shot to do something different, and it was a Screen Gems movie. Mm -hmm. And back then, Screen Gems was doing stuff like The Brothers, Two Can Play That Game, you know, all those kind of movies that were, that were hot. You know, Deliverance from Eva, Screen Gems was like, you know, the studio that was doing all the cool black stuff that was making money. And that was our first screen this movie. And, um, you know, it made us quote unquote, legit filmmakers in Hollywood. That's what's up. And so yeah. that led to Stomp the Yard yeah. after that. And how did y'all just get the script for Stomp the Yard? I wanted to know like how that came across y'all desk in the first place. So Stomp the Yard was, um, Somebody, you know, kicked to us the concept about doing, you know, a step show movie. So we started looking into that and developing that. And Screen Gems, again, had just done the movie You Got Served. Mm. So they had already had that big success with the B2K dance movie. So we were like, well, what if we did a movie with step dancing, right? Right. But <laughs> at the HBCU. And what we wanted to tell the story was, you know, pledging and Greek life and historically black colleges. What they wanted was a dance movie. So we said, well, let's put the two together. So Greg Anderson, our partner from TWA, initially wrote the first few drafts of, um, of, uh, of Stomp the Yard, of what became Stomp the Yard. He had, he had another it was project. called Stepping at first, right? Yeah, well, it, we called it Stepping, but his, I forget what the name of his project was before then, but it, 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 it originated with him as far as him writing the script. And Will was gonna produce, I was gonna direct, but because they wanted a dance movie, they wanted a music video director. So they brought in a uh, guy, Sylvain White, who even though we did music videos, had also done some other really cool movies. Mm -hmm. So great filmmaker, he came in and killed it. Oh yeah, and, classic, and Stomp the Yard's a classic. Oh yeah, so look man, so Stomp the Yard, Stomp, Stop the Yard made us super legit in Hollywood because it was the number one movie in the country two weeks in a row, um, you know, shot in Atlanta by us. So, um, it was, you know, as far as we were concerned, like our, our, our filmmaking lives, you know, took off from there. I don't know if people, first of all, if anybody don't know, I was in Stomp the Yard also. Uh, I had two lines and I stood behind Neo the whole damn movie. I was <laughs> like, where the camera at? It's going to be on Neo. Let me stand right <laughs> behind this dude. Uh, the crazy thing about the gospel is, was that Idris Elba first movie? Yeah. Yeah, so so he had, he was on the wire. And so then he did an HBO movie, that was like a director HBO movie about like African genocide. And then he came into the gospel, and that was his first theatrical movie ever. That's was, crazy. Uh, was our movie. That's yeah. when I realized he wasn't uh, American. I was, <laughs> I was on set, and I heard him talking in the bridge. I said, "Who is who is this nigga? What?" I was like, yeah. "This ain't who I know from from the Wire at all." This ain't. Let me say what's crazy was, was when me and him met about doing the gospel. I went and met with him, and I didn't know that he was British either. 
So I went back and I told my manager, I was like, yo, this, it'll never work. The dude got an English accent. They, he was like, Rob, listen, he's been stringer bell on the wire for all these years and you never knew. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, that do make sense. All right. Yeah. All right, so, oh, hilarious. He pulled up a, <laughs> a gospel. <laughs> so this is what I wanted to know. All right, y'all had like, like immense success, you and Will. When was the decision to y'all to y'all both go y'all separate ways when it came to the business? I know y'all still boys, but when it came yeah. to the business, when did y'all decide to to make that thing? And was there was there any particular like movie that maybe didn't do as well, or or what to make y'all make that decision? Because y'all was like uh, Batman and Superman. Hey, so look, it started after Stomp the Yard. So what oh. happened was that before Stomp the Yard, I directed everything for the most part. Will produce everything. And the times when I didn't direct was when it was like, okay, we don't want I don't want to direct Twa 3 or whatever, because I don't want to get pigeonholed. So when the studio um, didn't want me to direct Stomp the Yard, which was cool, but because the movie took off and made, you know, a lot of money, people just saw me and Willis producers. It was like they forgot I directed. Mm. So then I would go to, you know, actors that I knew, like, yo, so I got this project. They're like, oh, no, 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 no. you can't direct me. You know what I'm saying? Y'all produce this thing I want to do. We'll find a director. So it felt like it was hard for me to then get taken seriously as a feature director. And the people that were interested in me as a feature director wanted me to do, like, the gospel, too. Mm. So then TV opened up, and there was opportunities for me to apprentice. And... It was crazy because I started apprenticing in television. I was on ER on that show. And um, when I was doing that, you know, Stomp the Yard came out and was like number one in the country. And they was like, yo, intern boy, ain't that your movie? I was like, yeah. yeah. They was like, man, that's dope. Hey, but you gonna, you gonna get that coffee though? You gonna run me those copies? That's you know crazy. What I'm saying? So it was a really, humbling experience at that time. And so I think what happened was, is that over time, I, I got more and more experience with, you know, in TV. And even though me and Will will still come together and we would produce other projects together when I wasn't directing, just over time, we just did less and less together, right? And most of the projects that we had set up where I was gonna direct and he was gonna produce together just didn't, just didn't go for whatever reason, you know? You know, sometimes you develop five movie projects and none of them go. That's kind of what happened. So over time, we just wanted, we just wanted to do different stuff, but we were still homeboys and still are. So, you know, that's what happened. So when you got into directing TV more, because you're killing it, um, you're killing it with, with, yeah, man, absolutely. You directed, I don't remember what, hey, look at that. Okay, okay, we see what's going on around here. <laughs> um, we, this is what I wanted to know about TV directing. How much say so do you have when you come on to a set? Do you really have to stick to what they have written? How much freedom do they give you? Because I know when it comes to film, you have immense freedom. It, it, it seems that way. I, you know, I don't know how much the studio kind of get involved, but it seemed on TV, I wanted to know how much freedom do you have? Like when you're working on a show like Power, uh, do you have with the script and casting and, and all those type of things? Um, it depends on the show. You know what I'm saying? Some shows give you more, some shows give you less. But the main, the main difference is that in the features, it's a one-off. So if you go and do, you know, I don't know, Creed or Black Panther, right? And you're the director. Well, it's your vision. So it's like, well, what do you want to do? You know, and so you, you do that. Obviously, you got, you know, bosses at the studio and the producer or whatever. TV is different because you're doing an episode of something. So you look at an episode in the season as like a book. And I'm doing the 11th episode. So that's chapter 11. So I got to look to the writer to kind of give me a, some more direction because they know that chapter 11 is setting up something that's going to pay off in chapter 19. 
Mm. So I got to pay way more attention to what the writer needs. Um, and then I can, I can then put my stamp on it and say, okay, cool. So you want to do this? Well, let me try these five things. They say, eh, just try the four. Cool. So then those four things are my way of doing this. So that way it's like the best chapter 11 that I can make, but it still got to feel like it fits in that book. So I can't go and shoot something like all super crazy. And the way the show works is it's a lot more stable in how you do it. Right. Now, there's something else I was interested in. When it comes to directing the talent on a show like A Power, something that's successful, how much do the actors listen or are open to your suggestions um, when you give one? Because I even know being on MacGyver, you know, we're on our fifth season, and some directors will come in and you like, I got this. I think I've <laughs> I've been doing this for a while. And then there's other directors that come in and you like, that was a fucking great idea. Yeah. But I want to know when you're working on a show like a power, you know, and, and you give these suggestions, how open are the actors or do you find there's some type of uh, hesitation because they feel like they know these characters so well? Uh, it always depends on who the actor is. You know what I'm saying? I think that the, because everybody needs something different. Some actors really want direction and really want you to push them. Other people kind of want to just do what they do. So you kind of figure that out. But a lot of my direction has to do with story. You know what I'm saying? And at the end of the day, you can, you can be the character for 10 years. But if, if your notes are story driven, if your direction is story driven, then you're there to service the story. So it's not like I'm saying, hey, Justin, I know you live with this character, but do this because I think it's cool. Now nah, it's like, nah, but in this story that we're telling, here's what we want to show. And I think that when, for most actors, when they understand that, they tend to be more open. Right. You know, there's some that aren't, but most of them are like, oh, okay, you want to make this be the best thing that it can be, and I'm, I'm on board with that. And how do you deal with a difficult actor? Because I know you, I, I know, if anybody don't know, every show, a one-hour show, every one-hour show, there's at least one crazy cast member. At least one, period, without question. It never fails. <laughs> so how do you deal with the crazy one on set? Hey, trial and error. Trying to figure <laughs> out, trying to, hey, trying to figure out what they need, what's the best way to communicate with them. You touch and go. So you try, okay, that didn't work. Let me try this. Okay, that didn't work. Okay, let me try that. And you just keep doing that. And you know what I'm saying? And then when, when something happens that's good, you try to reinforce that. Like, yo, you killed it. You did a good job, yada, yada, yada. So then that way they really see what your vibe is. And there's sometimes when they just are, are on what they're on and you just got a job to do. So you, you try not to take it personal and you just keep it moving. And as long as you got what you need, it's all good. Right. I feel you. Yeah. I know you're doing TV, but are you still actively developing film projects? Is film directing something that's still a passion of yours? Or are you kind of more focused on TV because with the Netflix and Hulu and Amazon, there, there's a, a, a wide spectrum of places you could take and tell a, a story with a, that's episodic. Yeah, no, nah, listen, I, I'm, I'm looking to do both. So um, I have a producer partner, her name is Mitzi Miller. Um, and um, so we have a few different projects that are in different places, some are features. Um, so I'm hoping to be able to talk more about that soon as, some, as stuff is a little bit further along. But and we're also developing a bunch of uh, TV projects and things that are, that are really starting to take off. So I like them both, man, but I definitely want to do movies too. Um, but just, you know, it's telling good stories where I can, you know, build the world in a movie or do the pilot for a show. I love all that. I'm going to tell y'all why he want to do a pilot for a show, because any of y'all don't know. <laughs> if that show gets picked up, he gets a check <laughs> as long as that show is on the air. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's some shit that I found out. I was like, why these big, big A-list directors shooting these pilots? And then you find out when they get picked up, they get a check as long as it, and that's like money just coming in and you never have to be on set. 
James James Wan, you know James Wan, right? Direct all. I know the, him. Yeah, yeah. Well, we don't kick it, but I definitely know who he is. He direct all the big horror movies. He directed the pilot episode of MacGyver. He directed uh, Aquaman movie. Uh, but the Annabelle movies, all those horror mo movies that's successful, not the ones that don't do well, the ones that's successful, he directed them. That dude has not been on the set of MacGyver <laughs> since that pilot episode. We going on season five. I ain't seen him since, but better believe he collecting a check every episode. Hey, man. Uh, so the last thing is, I wanted to know, how do you feel about films going straight to these streaming services do you do you think because I, I know you come from a a, a a day and i i pretty much do too when you want to see movies at the theater um but now with the netflixes and all those types of films like is it a it's still a goal of yours to get your movies at the theaters or is this just, yo, I'm just trying to get it made and get it seen through any type of streaming outlet, you know, that I can? Um, I think the first goal is to get it made, but, you know, I'd rather, if possible, have it be in theaters. Because I feel like it's a different experience when you watch something, you know, in a theater and you have to leave your house and go there and you get to experience that with other people. So y'all laughing together or screaming together or whatever it is. And the presentation on the big screen is just, you know, it's, it's, it's just a different vibe. So, you know, and again, the work that you put in is still the same, even if it's on, you know, that you're watching on the phone, but just seeing it up there, man, just feels great. And just adds, adds to the magic of it, you know? Hey, be, uh, this, this just kept part of my head. Being, being a black director, right? How, how difficult, do you feel like it is to be a black director one to be able to direct a studio movie and two just to get a a, a studio film made in general well you know i think that like the interesting thing about being a black director is i think a lot of times it's easy for you to get pitched and hold in saying okay great black movie right that's you Okay, uh, or urban, you know what I'm saying? Oh, okay, urban pilot, that's you. Right. Um, one of the things that was interesting about TV was when I kind of got in there, most of the stuff that I did was mainstream shows. You know, they had a black person or two in there, but it was very different from when me and Will were first doing movies. Everything was, was about and for black people. And, you know, I love making content for people of color. I absolutely love it. But, doing these other, you know, shows, you know, that everybody loves also was just something different. I think that sometimes as a, as a, you know, director, as a black man who also directs, that sometimes people can overlook that and just say, oh, okay, Rob's black, he's from Atlanta. Okay, do we have, do we have, you know, the urban, you know, comedy, you know, and maybe the first thought isn't to say, can you do, you know, Aquaman the movie, right. you know what I'm saying? And so I, that's why I think that when people like John Singleton, like when he did Fast and Furious 2, you know what I'm saying? Or even or Ryan Coogler, you know, um, and he, you know, Black Panther, he has black people in it, but it's a big Marvel franchise movie. Like anytime that we get a chance to do that cool stuff, I think it's, um, you know, those are all big deals. That's not taken away from any of our movies. I love it all. Right. I'm just saying that a lot of the times we just get pigeonholes sometimes. Hey, straight up. Yeah. But hey, man, I just want to let you know, I appreciate you, brother. Thank you for your time. Um, like I said, man, I, I want to do this to, to celebrate people I feel like are living legends and making legendary moves. Um, I mean, this has definitely been one of the most informative. I, I usually just tell dick jokes the whole time. But I said, <laughs> you know what? <laughs> I said, but this particular one, I'm going to reframe from the penis <laughs> jokes and actually ask some intelligent questions. Um, but I, I really appreciate you sharing that information because I, listen, I'm gonna tell you, man, as a young black, you know, actor and comedian and somebody that aspires to direct and, and produce and do all those things, it's good to just hear this information because what's common knowledge to you 
is like gems for somebody like me and people that's gonna be watching and listening to this because sometimes it's, you just simply don't know. Um, right. And when you have somebody that's willing to share that information, um, it's doing such a service to the community to, to make sure that more people of color and more people with those dreams and aspirations could then go off and accomplish these things. Um, so I just want to say, I appreciate you. You a king, you know, keep doing your thing, brother. Um, and yeah, man, I appreciate you coming on. Hey, King Just, I appreciate you like always, my dude. And hopefully when I'm back on the A-side, we can, uh, we can do it up. Straight up, straight up. You know where I be. <laughs> All right, bro, peace out. My dude, for sure. Sweet, 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 sweet.